The second face of intention is one of my absolute favorites. I call it the face of kindness. It is my intention to be at peace with everyone in my life, including all of my relatives. <laughs> That's my intention. I insist that I will be at that place in my life. And so what, how do you do that? You have to, again, look at the resistance, look at the thoughts, and suggest to yourself, I am going to be, I am going to be kindness. Yesterday, we went to a movie. I came home from the movie, and there was a man on the street in Boston who was homeless. And he was mentally challenged, obviously. And, I, and he had a little cup, and he asked for some change. And I lent blessing to these people. And then uh, I was walking, and I kept thinking, you're giving a talk tomorrow about kindness. And I went back, and I had about $4 worth of change in my pocket, and I had to chase him. He went downstairs someplace, and uh, he, uh, he was dirty, and he was, uh, you know, and he couldn't speak right. And, he, and I took this change, and I just took his cup, and I put it, and you would have thought that I had given this man, you know, a million dollars. I mean, he, he followed me. He couldn't stop thanking me. Tears were coming down. It's a simple little act of kindness. And I'm not suggesting to every single one of you that everybody who asks you for money, you are obliged to give them money. But can you give them a silent blessing? Can you give them a smile instead of looking for using them as a reason to be upset? And you have to, you know, folks, you got to do this with all of your, all of your uh, relatives as well, particularly your own children and your own parents. You got to look at them and see every time that I have a thought that is not one of kindness, what I am doing is I am leaving the source and taking on ego consciousness. Here's a fascinating piece of research. You know what serotonin is? Serotonin is like this neurotransmitter, this enzyme in the, in the body, in the brain. And the more of it that you have, the better you feel. It's the well-being feeling. And this well-being feeling is something that antidepressants are designed to stimulate. So that when you take these names that have become common out there, um, we, uh, <coughs> we associate this with, they are designed to stimulate the production of serotonin. Serotonin is very difficult to measure. It's done through the metabolites in the urine, but they're getting, e they're getting better at measuring it. Here's a fascinating study that was just completed. That any person who is the recipient of an act of kindness has their serotonin levels increased just because they received an act of kindness and their immune system is strengthened because they received this dose of kindness. That's the recipient. And secondly, any person who is the giver, the provider of an act of kindness. Anything you ever do which is a providing an act of kindness, and that's, see, here's a universal source that can't be anything other than what it is. It can't be something foreign to itself. So it doesn't, it's, it's always creating, are you? It is always creating what it creates, treating it with kindness. Here, this is, this source can create worlds. <laughs> it creates it creates planets and systems. And whether you look through the microscope or whether you look through the telescope, it's impossible to say which has the grander view. It's impossible to say because they all lead to infinity. And this is the source that creates worlds. It creates you. It doesn't, why would it create? It can create anything. Why would it create stuff that it's not kindly toward, like avocados? No thanks. I don't want an avocado. <laughs> why would it do that? It doesn't have to. It can create anything, this source, from which all emanates. If you, if you are the provider of an act of kindness towards anyone, but particularly towards the people that you're close to in your life, and particularly towards strangers with just a smile or an act of kindness, or, you know, I can afford a quarter, I can afford a dollar, I'm going to go back. And just, you know, and not making a big deal about it, the serotonin levels in you 
are increased in the same, to the same degree that they are in the receiver. And so is your immune system strengthened. You want to strengthen your immune system? Be kind. But even more dramatic than that, I get excited about this. Because <laughs> this is what blows me away about, is that the observer of an act of kindness, the observer of an act of kindness has their serotonin levels and their immune system strengthened just because they're in the energy field of someone who is displaying kindness. When you see someone being kind to another person, it's like a dose of an antidepressant. It's like a serotonin rush. Very often in my talks, and I'll ask, who is the person out there in the audience who had someone buy your ticket? Because you couldn't afford it. And you couldn't afford to come here, and they paid your way to get here. And they just wanted you to be here because they felt it was so important that you be there. And someone will always raise their hand, I'll bring them up, and I'll say, so what did they spend? And they'll say, a hundred dollars. They gave me a hundred, and they couldn't even afford it themselves. And I'll reach in my pocket, and I'll hand her the hundred dollars, and I'll say, could I extend to you this kindness back so that you can repay that person? And everyone, in the, you can see teeth that you couldn't see for the previous hour. Everybody is smiling and laughing and happy and excited, and all I, it cost me a hundred bucks. You know how much antidepressant you'd have to take? <laughs> That's, that's $10,000 worth of pills, and you've got to call your doctor. Do I need the purple one? I want to get some clams. I don't know if I'm going to get them. Every act of kindness. Let me share with you a story. It's a story that I included in The Power of Intention. It's a story that I want to share here with you today. It is one of the most beautiful, and it's a true story as well. It goes like this. I call it the Shia story. In Brooklyn, New York, this is titled, Where is God's Perfection? In Brooklyn, New York, Chush, C-H-U-S-H, Chush, is a school that caters to learning disabled children. Some children remain in Chush for their entire school career, while others can be mainstreamed into conventional schools. At a Chush fundraising event, a dinner, the father of a Chush child delivered a speech that would never be forgotten by all who attended. After extolling the school and its dedicated staff, he cried out, Where is the perfection in my son Shia? Everything God does is done with perfection, but my child cannot remember facts and figures as other children do. Where is God's perfection here? The audience was shocked by the question and pained by the father's anguish and stilled by the piercing query. I believe, the father answered, that when God brings a child like Shia into the world, the perfection that he seeks is in the way people react to this child. He then told the following story about his son Shia. One afternoon, Shia and his father walked past a park where some boys Shia knew were playing baseball. Shia asked his father, do you think they'll let me play? Shia's father knew that his son was not at all athletic and that most boys wouldn't even want him on their team, but Shia's father understood that if his son was chosen to play, it would give him a sense of belonging. And as you know, Maslow's highest level of consciousness is on that pyramid is a feeling of belonging. And Shia never felt that way. Shia's father approached one of the boys on the field and asked if Shia could play. The boy looked around for some guidance from his teammates, and getting none, he took matters into his own hands. And he said, well, we're losing by six runs, and the game is in the eighth inning. I guess he can be on our team, and we'll try to put him up to bat in the ninth inning. Shia's father was ecstatic as Shia smiled broadly. Shia was told to put on a glove and go out to play in center field. In the bottom of the eighth inning, Shia's team scored a few runs, but they were still behind by three. In the bottom of the ninth inning, Shia's team scored again, and now with two outs and the bases loaded, Shia was scheduled to be up with the potential winning run on base. Would the team actually let Shia bat at this juncture of the game and give away their chance to win? 
Surprisingly, Shia was given the bat. Everyone knew that it was all but impossible because Shia didn't even know how to hold a bat, let alone hit with it. However, as Shia stepped up to the plate, the pitcher moved in a few steps so he could lob the ball in softly so that Shia would at least be able to make contact with the ball. The first pitch came in, Shia swung clumsily and he missed. And then one of Shia's teammates came up out of the dugout and together he and Shia held the bat and faced the opposing pitcher waiting for the next pitch, the two of them. The pitcher again took in a few more steps toward Shia so he could toss the ball even more softly. And as the pitch came in, Shia and his teammate together swung the bat and together they hit a slow ground ball to the pitcher. The pitcher picked up the soft grounder and could easily have thrown the ball to the first baseman. Shia would have been out and that would have ended the game. But instead, the pitcher took the ball and threw it on a high arc to right field, far beyond the reach of the first baseman. Everyone started yelling, Shia, Shia, run to first, run to first. Never in his life had Shia run to first. He scampered down the baseline, wide-eyed and startled. By the time he reached first base, the right fielder had the ball, and he could have thrown the ball to the second baseman who would tag out Shia, who was still running. <laughs> but the right fielder understood what the pitcher's intentions, intentions were. So he threw the ball high and far over the third baseman's head. Everyone yelled, run to second, Shia, run to second. Shia ran toward second base as the runners ahead of him deliriously circled the bases toward home. As Shia reached second base, the up to him turned him in the direction of third base and shouted, run to third, Shia, run to third. As Shia rounded third, the boys from both teams ran behind him screaming, Shia, Shia, run home, run home. Shia ran home, stepped on home plate, and all 18 boys lifted him on their shoulders and made him the hero as he had just hit a grand slam and won the game for his team. That day, said his father, now with soft tears rolling down his face, those 18 boys reached their level of God's perfection. Is that a beautiful story? It always touches me. <laughs> Creativity, kindness, the first two faces of intention. The third face of intention is called simply love. My friend Leo Biscaglia, you remember Leo? Leo who wrote a book about love and who did many things for public television. Two days before he died, he wrote me a beautiful letter and he said, Wayne, just keep doing what you're doing. You're on the right path. And he said, the sun is always shining behind the clouds. Stay connected. That was from my friend Leo Biscaglia, who I hardly knew, but he wrote about love and he talked about it on PBS, oh, many, many years ago, decades ago now. My intention, and I wrote a chapter on this, is called, it is my intention to respect myself at all times. Your view of the world really depends upon how much you respect yourself. How much love do you have for yourself? When you trust in yourself, you're trusting in the same wisdom that created you. When you fail to trust in yourself, when you fail to love yourself, you are denying your own divinity and therefore attracting the exact opposite of what this source is. This is a source 
of love. It is a source of great respect. It doesn't create anything that it doesn't have a loving feeling toward. If you don't have that feeling of love toward yourself, you can't extend it outward, for who can give away what they don't have for themselves? Who can do that? I've often used the metaphor of an orange. If you squeeze an orange, you get out of it orange juice. Why? It's an orange. That's what's inside. And when you squeeze you, someone puts pressure on you, says something about you that you don't like, and out of you comes anger and hatred and bitterness and tension and fear and anxiety and depression and worry and stress. It's not because of who did the squeezing. It's not because of the instrument they used or the timing. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with what's inside. If you don't have love for yourself, you're not trusting in the wisdom that created you. And the idea of being able to respect yourself at all times. How do you go about doing this? You spend your life in a state of cooperation rather than competition. You see yourself as someone who is love in action. It's one of the things that I have written on my return address when I write someone uh, back. It says that it'll have my name and then the address, and above my name it says, love in action. That's what you have to be, love in action. You, you suggest to yourself and you say these words to yourself, I am whole, I am perfect as I was created. I am whole and I am perfect as I was created. And I came from a source that not only determined the shape of my eye, and the shape of my body and the color of my skin and my height, but I came from a source that had a great idea about who I should be as well. And you sense that. And that cannot be fulfilled, it cannot be actualized, it cannot be created if you are not in a state of love. Now when are you not in a state of love? Whenever you judge another human being, you do not define them with your judgment. You define yourself as someone who needs to judge. If I call you stupid, that does not make you stupid. That makes me a person who has to put labels on other people. And as Soren Kierkegaard, the great Danish theologian, once said, once you label me, you negate me. Match game, match game are my thoughts in harmony with that source from which I emanated? Because, folks, when they are, the right people will show up, and the right events will transpire. And everything that you need in what Carl Jung called synchronicity, that there is almost like what happens when you are in a state of love and not having resistance to that, there is like a collaboration with fate. So judging anybody else just says, I need to judge. It doesn't make them what they are. And all I can say to you, each and every one of you, about love and loving yourself is this, that true nobility, true nobility, is not about being better than anyone else. It's about being better than you used to be. It's about being better than you used to be. All I can say to you up here as I speak to you now at this age, that I'm not better than one person out there watching or one person here in this beautiful theater. But I know for certain that I'm better than I used to be in almost every, not in almost, in every single way that that can be measured. I know that. I know that as a human being, as a writer, as a father, as a grandfather, as whatever it is that I am in my life, I am better than I used to be. Be love. The fourth face of intention is the face of beauty. Here we have a source. Here we have a source that is ultimate truth. It is the source from which you emanated. It's invisible. It's formless. Particles themselves do not create more particles. 
You need this to create a particle. And here is one of the most beautiful quotes about beauty, written by one of the people who probably knows as much about beauty as anybody. His name was Michelangelo. I don't know if you've ever been to uh, Florence and you've seen David. I mean, just to stand in the same room. I went there to just look at David. I had no idea that David was 18 feet tall. And that I stood there, not for 20 minutes. My whole family went traveling all over Florence. I said, come back. I can't leave. I was mesmerized by the beauty. And I always love what Michelangelo said when they asked him, how could, out of one piece of marble, how could you create something so beautiful? And he said, David was already in there. I just chipped away the excess. David is in you. Beauty is in you. And here's what he said about beauty. He said, every beauty which is seen here below, down here below, by persons of perception resembles more than anything else that celestial source from which we all come. <laughs> Isn't that great? Every beauty that we see resembles more than anything else that source. We're talking about source, connecting to source, from which we all come. Do you see beauty? Do you see it more or less in your life? Can you find it in a homeless person urinating on the street? Can you find beauty in a cockroach? As you reach higher levels of consciousness, you begin to see, not only do you see beauty everywhere and in everything, you begin to recognize it as truth. One of my favorite quotes that I wrote about, and years ago I wrote a book called Wisdom of the Ages, and it was a collection of 60 essays. We did a public television special on it, and many of you uh, watched it and contributed to PBS from it. And there was a young man, a Victorian poet, in, um, <clears throat> in England named John Keats. He died at the age of 24. He wrote thousands of poems, many, many essays, 24. And he said these words, and I wrote an essay about it, but I must confess to you, because I'm better than I used to be, <laughs> <laughs> I must confess to you that I didn't really understand this quote until I wrote The Power of Intention, until I put together this program here for you. I didn't really fully grasp it. I get it now. I get it. And it's the last line in a poem called Ode on a Grecian Urn. And the couplet goes like this. Beauty is truth. See, this is truth. This is the source from which we all emanate. And we leave when we take on an ego. Beauty is truth. Truth, beauty. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. From one of the greatest poets of his time. Your natural state is beauty, joy, tranquility. I want to experience beauty. And you know, the way to get beauty into your life is to say, I only attract it. And I take the path of least resistance. I take the path of least resistance. What's the path of least resistance? The path that says, I am as closely aligned with this energy as it's possible to be. You know, in 1978, I had a wonderful opportunity, one of the great opportunities of my life. I was invited by an organization called YPO, Young President's Organization, to come to Vienna in Austria. It was at the time when uh, erroneous zones and pulling your own strings were topping all the charts, and they invited me to come over and, and lecture to all these presidents. I was 38 years old and very much in more of an ego mode than I have uh, learned to become in my life. But I was honored to go over there, and I had read a book when I was in college, and I was teaching at a university, and I taught this book. It's called uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And it was written by a man who was a survivor of the Holocaust. His name was Viktor Frankl. And Viktor Frankl decided that he had to survive the Holocaust because he had to tell the story. 
That was his purpose. We got to Vienna and I found out that little Wayne Dyer, this little kid who lived in foster homes and worked for everything he ever had in his life, was on the same panel with Viktor Frankl. Man's search for meaning. I just sat there in awe. I remember what Rumi once said. He said, sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment. Just be in a state of bewilderment. And I was just totally in awe to be sitting in the same room, let alone on the same panel, let alone discussing in front of these presidents this, uh, with this man who had had everything taken away from him. He was a psychiatrist who was taken off to, to the uh, concentration camps in Nazi, Nazi Germany. And he described how he survived. The Nazis gave him a bowl of soup, which was just hot water, with even sometimes bugs floating around in it. And there was a dead fish head for flavor in the soup. That was his meal for the day. And he described the beauty. Not the anger, because the anger, and he learned very early that anger and resentment and hatred are low energies that always weaken you. He learned to find beauty in a floating fish head. You've got to be able to find it everywhere. Beauty is truth. Truth, beauty. They are one. Find it in as many places as you can. The next face of intention is what I call the face of expansiveness. And the intention that I have for this is, it is my intention to express the genius that I am. I love that uh, Bucky Fuller, Buckminster Fuller once wrote, everyone is born a genius, but the process of living de-geniuses you. <laughs> it does. This source is an expanding source. It's a forming power. You have to be a forming power. You have to be in a state of expansion, a state of seeing yourself in the same way that this universal source sees you. You are a genius. Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge. More important than knowledge. He also said something very powerful. He said, all I want to do is to learn to think like God thinks. All the rest is details. <laughs> it's just details. How much time do you spend in your life on the details? This program is about learning to think, feel, and sound like your source, like source energy. So you have to pay attention within you to all of your inner thoughts that have any doubt in them. Hawkins talks about this in Power Versus Force, that everyone that is labeled a genius has something called radical humility. They don't brag about it. They don't talk about how great they are. They just know that they came from a source and they came here to do something. And to me, I mean, I have people that show up in my life who think that because I can get up in front of an audience or because I can sit down and write that this makes me a genius. <laughs> and, you know, I, folks, you know, if my car doesn't start, I open up the hood and I'm looking for on, off. <laughs> <laughs> Hoping to find a switch in there. <laughs> That's just, because otherwise I am completely challenged when it comes to fixing things. And I want it that way. I encourage that, all right? I don't want to be spending my energy fixing screen doors. And I've made that really clear. So <laughs> I just manifest screen door repairers in my life. The way that you stay with this field of expansion is that you align with the spiritual energy that is really the genius from which you originated. You are a genius. One of the most important things that you can do is look for the genius in others. See it in everyone, in everything that they do, and remind them of that. I have eight children. Every single one of them is a genius in their own way. Every one of them. One of my daughters, is who you'll be hearing in a few moments is a genius when it comes to taking the microphone and singing one of my daughters has such power in her ability 
to get on a horse and to take little children and to show them how to ride a horse. And she looks with her long, flowing blonde hair when she's out there, and she takes these little children, and it just, she just touches my heart. And, and it's so powerful. And she knows that this is her purpose. Her purpose has something to do. She can't ever stop thinking about anything that doesn't have something to do with horses. Every paper she ever had to write in school has something to do with that. She's her own little genius. I have a son who is a, uh, who, who's a surfer and who's also made up his own language. He speaks a language that he and a few of his friends can do. And I have a brother, my brother David is the same way. He created a language when we were 13 and 14 years old, and I still speak it today. And nobody else understands anything about it whatsoever. If I say clodopole, diapeaker, or the beady banal, only my kids will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> There's not a person in the whole country, but my brother Dave watching this, he'll know what I'm talking about. That's a genius. All of my children have this in one form or another. And each and every one of you have that as well. Don't let life de-genius you. You came from a source, a source that creates perfection. The next face of intention is called the face of abundance. And the face of abundance, remember I go back, this creative source reacts to your belief in shortages with a fulfillment of your belief. So if you believe and know and are certain that you can't attract abundance into your life, but I want to tell you tonight, you tuned in to somebody who knows about abundance. I have always been able to create abundance in my life. When I was a little kid, all the other kids in the, the places that I lived and so on, and even at, when we got back at home with my mom, pop bottles. You remember soda pop bottles? You could collect them, little knee-high bottles and Pepsi-Cola bottles and Coca-Cola bottles and uh, two cents if you took them back. I was a master at collecting pop bottles. I could manifest a pop bottle just like that. It was just... <laughs> We used to have uh, furnaces that had coal in them. And I would go along and I would empty people's ashes that they would set out. So I'd just take it out to the islands. I would go to the grocery store and because my imagination was always working on abundance, <clears throat> I would carry gr groceries out for little old ladies. You know what I'm doing today? Right now? <coughs> Collecting pop bottles. And taking out ashes. And taking out groceries for little old ladies. Just a bigger stage. See, if I came to this source and said, I don't have enough, this source doesn't know how to react to I don't have enough. This source is an endless supply. It's like the ocean. You can take 10 million gallon tank to the ocean of abundance, and you can take it out every hour, or you can take a thimble once a year, and the ocean doesn't care. It makes no difference to the ocean because everything returns to this source. Every time I walk, wherever I go, in fact, it happened to me uh, this morning. I found a, a, a dime. A dime? That's like major. <laughs> a dime. <laughs> That's ten pennies. <laughs> That's five bottles. <laughs> and whenever I bend over, and I notice that it gets a little further away, <laughs> <laughs> I bend over and I pick up this coin and I always say, thank you, God for this symbol of abundance that always flows into my life. Never once have I ever said, how come only a dime? I need a, I need a, a thousand dollars. Why are you only giving me a dime? It reminds me of a wonderful story of a grandmother who was living in that consciousness and she was walking along the beach and she had her little grandson with, him, with her and all of a sudden this huge wave came right out of the uh, ocean gobbled up, took the son, and he was gone, just disappeared. She got down on her knees, she prayed, oh my God, please send my grandson back. How could this be? This is the worst moment of my life. Please send my grandson back. I never... And all of a sudden, another wave came along and plop! There was her grandson, right there next to her feet. And she looked up and she said, um, he was wearing a hat. <laughs> The 
The face of abundance is like you have to come to this source not with what is missing because it doesn't know. There's nothing missing. It, this source, which is the source of all, doesn't know about what's missing. When you say, please give me what is missing, it'll just reaffirm your belief in things being missing. You have to come to this source with, by being abundant, by being in a state of gratitude, by being thankful for all that you are and seeing yourself as attracting more and more of that and being willing to give it away. The final face of these faces, the seventh face of intention, is what I call the face of receptivity. It is my intention to attract ideal people and ideal relationships into my life. This universal source is what I call an equal opportunity provider. It knows nothing. It knows nothing about not being receptive. It doesn't show up in you and not in you. It isn't anything that would judge one as better than the other. Are you receptive? Are you receptive to everyone? And you know, this works so well. My secretary and I, Maya, who's sitting up here in the box, who's been with me for 25 years. I can't shake her. As much magic as I try, <laughs> she just keeps showing up. I couldn't do it without her. And we were leaving for a talk in um, Chicago, I believe it was, from Florida. And we had uh, seven boxes of books to take with us on the plane. This was in the days when you could take what you wanted on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> and we were scheduled out on one airline that I was a platinum something or other on. And um, we found out that the flight was canceled. And they had already checked the boxes in. And then, um, well, they sent us to another airline at the other end of the terminal. So we wheel up there, we go up there with the seven boxes, and she's up there, and this woman's got a scowl on her face at this new airline. And almost as if she was saying, you won't be getting these boxes on this plane. And she was determined that that was gonna, not receptive to this idea whatsoever. Now my way I handle these kinds of things in my life is by every time, if I meet a surly waitress or a surly waiter, or if I meet someone who, when I'm checking into a hotel, is giving me a hard time, to me, this is just a wonderful opportunity to practice the power of intention. Can I be receptive to this person and have them eating out of my hand in no time at all? And it isn't by being phony or artificial, it's by trusting that if, I, if I'm receptive to this person, if I'm sending love to this person, if I'm sending kindness, if I am being what my source is, if I am in harmony, in rapport with source energy, then I can create an ally. So my secretary was about to, you know, and I just said, Maya, don't say a word. And I went up to the woman and I just started talking to her and I, before she, because I knew, I could just tell by her body language that she was about to tell me, you're only gonna be able to take two boxes with you for each person and you're gonna have to leave three here. But that just wasn't on my agenda whatsoever. <laughs> and I reached into my briefcase and I took out a book and I signed it. I said, you know, I'd really like you to have this. I, I appreciate you putting us on your flight. Uh, and I started talking to her in this really kind kind of way and I said, it's just, you know, we just missed this other flight. I've got to give a talk up here in Chicago. And I <clears throat> extended as much kindness as I possibly could. I was totally receptive and open to her. And by the time this encounter ended, she was asking, don't you have any more boxes? Isn't there something else <laughs> that you'd like to ship? Do you want to ship one of your kids? We can... And, <laughs> upgraded us to first class, gave us everything that we could possibly have wanted, and it was all because of being receptive to her, having this, this space of receptivity. When you have receptivity, when you are practicing infinite patience, when you are being the kind of person you wish to attract, you have to want it more for others than you do for yourself. You have to see yourself already as connected to the right person. See yourself from the end. And see yourself as having all of the right people showing up. Act as if they're already here. Because that's what the source is. And they are already here. I'm telling you, when I'm writing and I'm in the space that I'm defining here right now and speaking about right here, when I'm in this space, I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that everybody shows up that I need. And it almost gets to a point where um, I get befuddled by it, how beautiful and blissfully it works. I'm even befuddled by, what, by you all showing up. 
we just put a little notice out there and said, come to Boston. Please come to Boston. Isn't that a song? <laughs> and you all did. Thousands of you. Look at you. All over the place. This beautiful place and these lobbies and going all the way up into... There's people up there. I thought, you're a thousand miles away. It's a, you're all here. <laughs> and when I'm writing, I'll, my eyes will glance on a book that's been on the bookshelf for 20 years and I haven't looked at and I'll walk past it and it'll fall. What is that? And I'll pick it up, and it's exactly what I needed. The phone will ring, and the right, exact right person will show up. When you're in this place of being receptive, kind, loving, beauty, abundance, when you're in this place, the universe conspires with you to create the right people, the right things. It all shows up. It's not your ego. I don't do it. It's called surrender. It's called, in the recovery movement, we call this letting go and letting God. Just letting go. You have a senior partner, if you knew, who walked beside you at all times on this path that you've chosen, you could never have another doubt that this would work. And I'm telling you, you tuned in today on this PBS show to listen to somebody who has believed, not only do I believe in this and write about it, speak about it, I live it every day of my life. It always works. When I sat down to write this book, The Power of Intention, I had no idea what chapter two was going to be when I wrote chapter one. I only had the quotes that I gave at the beginning of the show from Max Planck and Carlos Castaneda. That's all I had. Chapter two unfolded, chapter three, and then one day, the exact second half of the entire book, all of these intentions, it all just flowed, as did this show. It all works in perfect harmony. Back in the 13th century, there was a man who, his name was Francesco, and we named the city of San Francisco for this little monk. He gave up all of his worldly possessions, and he provided us with a message. Remember earlier I said um, Einstein's observation that all of us, everybody else is concerned with details. All I want to do is learn to think like God. Do you see what I, he meant now? Can you see that? He wants to think and sound and feel like his source. Well, Francesco, who later became known as St. Francis of Assisi, a place where I've visited many times and feel a very deep and powerful connection in fact, there was a powerful statue of Francesco next to me during the entire writing of uh, The Power of Intention, and it was carved for me by the ancestors who lived in Assisi right there for me. One day I watched them do the carving for me and feel his presence. I'm telling you, I feel him right now, right here on this stage. And I asked Skysey, who I talked to you about earlier, if she would just come out and what she is going to sing to you a cappella is the words of this little man who are, as you listen to the words, I'd like you to remember it is your way of connecting to intention. You can connect with these messages. My beautiful daughter, who I'm honored to have here on the stage with me, come out here, sweetheart. Her name is Sky, Sky Dyer. Look at this. You're so beautiful. Oh, right back. Thank you. Make me a channel of your peace where there is hatred. Let me bring your love Where there is injury Your pardon love And where there's doubt Your faith in you Make me a channel of your peace Where there's despair in life Let me bring hope where there's darkness, only light. And where there's sadness, ever joy. Oh, my ass regret that I may never seek. 
So much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of your peace. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned love, in giving of ourselves that we receive, and in dying we are born to eternal life. O oh, Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of your peace. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned love, in giving of ourselves that we receive, and in dying we are born to eternal life. Thank you. The words to that I'd like you to play over and over again. The words to that are very powerful words. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is sadness, joy. It's not a prayer. It's not a religious statement. It is a beautiful technology for teaching us to bring the presence of higher spiritual, divine, organizing intelligence to the presence of every energy that is not of this source. Every energy of hatred, anger, fear, worry. And we need it in the world more than we've ever needed it before. I'd like to suggest to you that when you learn to connect to intention, as I've been discussing here in this program, that something will happen as you go out into the world. You will find that your presence, your presence will do things to other people, even without you being aware of it. When you are at this level, one of the things that happens is you begin to instill calmness. We convince others by our presence, said Walt Whitman. People will feel calmer when they're around you. You'll be, you ever be in a group of people where you instantly know that when you're around them, it just feels good. You feel better about yourself just for having been in the room with them. That's what will happen. And there's also people who, when you're in the room with them, you want to run away because they bring very low energy. And people say to me, you know, other people are always bringing me down. I'm working with, if you knew what my family was like, if you lived with the people I live with, you wouldn't be saying these kind of things. And I say, low energy people can never bring you down. You have low energy because you hate people for hating you. You get angry at people for being angry at you. You judge people for judging you. You join others in their low energy. What did Sky just say? Make me a channel of your peace. Don't send me peace. Francesco didn't say, I need some peace. <laughs> I'm short of peace. But this is only peace. It can only provide, make me a channel of this. Allow me to be this. Your presence, um, when you connect to intention, to the field of intention, as I've been describing it here today, your presence makes other people feel energized. They want to do more. 
They want to write. They want to create their music. They want to make Mr. Holland's opus. It's like, we, who doesn't love that movie? And it isn't because it was such a great movie, which I think it happens to be, but it was because everybody, every one of us has that in Rocky. How many people saw Rocky? Remember Rocky by Sylvester Stallone? And you walk out of there, and you might despise boxing, but you go, eh. There's a Rocky in me. <laughs> we all feel, you walk out of that, you just feel like, it's like your presence makes others feel connected and uplifted. Your presence makes other people feel purposeful. It inspires them to greatness. And there's also an impact that you have on the consciousness of all of humanity. In Power Versus Force, again, Hawkins speaks about what happens to us what happens to us when we, here we have in this room probably a thousand or more people in this beautiful majestic theater in Boston. Just by your being here, just by watching this program and taking on some of these ideas, you change the energy of the entire planet. Everything is connected to everything else. The Native Americans used to say, no tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. We're all branches on a tree called humanity. What I'd like to do is just do a quick summary now of what I call the dire dozen. And this is the 12 points that I have been speaking about and, and talking about here in this entire program. There are 12 of them. I'm just going to spend a moment or two on each of them. If you want to jot these down while you're watching, I would encourage you to keep track of these 12 ideas, the dire dozen, for connecting to intention. One, want more for others than you want for yourself. Want more for others. Whatever it is that you perceive to be missing, whatever health problems that you may have, whatever addictions you're struggling with, whatever lack of uh, love that you have in your life, whatever lack of peace that you have with your aunts and your uncles or your parents or your in-laws, want the peace that you seek for yourself more for them. Want it more for them. That is how we create this level of consciousness. Secondly, think from the end. Begin to see yourself surrounded by the people and the events and the things that you would like to have only see yourself. You're having a problem with an addiction, see yourself as addiction free. See yourself, if you'd like to have, if you'd like to, if there's a car that you want. My son was perfect at this, Sands. I mean, he's just so good at this. Because there's a certain car that he wanted, it's yellow. And he, not, he didn't just bug me about it every day, which they all do. <laughs> And all kids will do that. But he saw himself. He got a picture of it. He put it on his computer. It's the background of his, of his computer, this yellow whatever it is. All right? I call it the school bus. <laughs> I told him I was going to put cab fares on the side of it, but that's what he wanted. Huh? And then he saw him, and then he went down and he drove it. And uh, it was a used car, and he got on the internet, and he, he just saw himself in it. He couldn't not see himself in it. You know, young, we call this just persistence and being a pain in the rear end oftentimes, but it's not that at all. What it is, is young people have this instant knowing and awareness that I can create what I want for myself in my life, and the way that I do it is I act as if it's already here. And, you just, and almost like they won't, be, they won't be denied it. That's what intention is. It's not that pit bull attitude. It's that awareness that I am thinking from the end, it's already here because everything that you think is missing from your life is already here. The third of these dozen is to be an appreciator in your life. Be an appreciator. Look for that which is valuable rather than worthless. Look, you go out and you buy a house. And 10 years later, we say it appreciates in value. What does that mean? What does it mean that a car, that a house rather, appreciates? It is more what? Valuable. It's more val Same thing with you. If you're an appreciator, you have more value. Now you buy a car, you drive it off of the lot, and they say, well, it just depreciated by 20%. What does that mean? <laughs> it is not as valuable as it was before. When you depreciate, you take your value away. 
When you appreciate, you make yourself valuable. What could be more valuable than being connected to source? Four, stay in rapport with source energy. Stay in rapport. Your job here is to be in a state of harmony with this. Constantly reminding yourself, is this how my source thinks? Five, resistance. Understand this about resistance. Every thought that you have that is other than that which you emanated from is resistance. Every unkind thought, every uncreative thought, every thought of judgment, every thought of fear, every thought of depression, every thought of it can't happen, all resistance. So if you say, well, easy for him, he can talk about this, but I can't, that's resistance. You're right, absolutely. Even if you think all of this is a bunch of nonsense, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely, because for you, that's what you believe. And if you believe that, the universal source will help you to fulfill that belief. Sixth is what I talked about many times in the program. Contemplate yourself as surrounded by the conditions which you want to produce. Contemplate yourself that. Because the way you are one with source. You are always one with source. You are one with all of its principles, all of those phases. You are one with it. It can't be anything other than it is. Neither can you. Seven, understand the art of allowing. Allowing means taking the path of least resistance. Every time you have a thought that, doesn't, that, it, that has resistance in it, what you have done is you have created an absence of allowing. You have to, you have to almost think like, here I am here, and here's source. How much energy can I pull from it? How much energy can I pull from it? Are you pulling energy from source, or are you, are you away from it? Allowing. Allow yourself. Eight, practice radical humility. You are not this body that you are in. You are not this mind that you are in. You are not any of the possessions that you have. You are a divine source. Nine, be in a constant state of gratitude. Be grateful for everything that shows up. Everything. Stay in a state of being generous and grateful in your life. Because what could be more generous than that which has allowed you to come from the infinite source to this material world and back? 10. Keep in mind that you can never resolve a problem by condemning it. Any problem that you have, when you use shame, you are using the lowest energy that's out there in the universe. You cannot shame your way into higher consciousness, into source energy. Eleven, play the match game. Play the match game. Always ask yourself, am I matched up with the field of intention? And finally, meditate. Make it a practice in your life. Meditation is essential because it is your way of staying connected to source. What is the only thing in the universe that can't be divided? You cannot divide God. Everything else has an up, down, north, south, east, west, male, female, right, wrong, black, white, alive, dead. Everything comes in dichotomies, except for silence. Silence. You cut it in half, what do you get? More silence. Cut it in half again, more silence. Cut source in half, just more source. You can't divide it. Meditation, stay in the gap. I'd like to close out this program on the power of intention with a story that um, was sent to me by a dear friend, Ellen. It's called Attitude. 92-year-old, petite, well-poised, and proud lady who's fully dressed each morning by 8 o'clock, 92 years old, with her hair fashionably coiffed and makeup perfectly applied, even though she's legally blind and moved to a nursing home today. Her husband of 70 years recently passed away, making the move necessary. After many hours of waiting patiently in the lobby, of this nursing home, she smiled sweetly when she told her room was now ready. 
as she maneuvered her walker to the elevator, I provided a visual description of her tiny room, including the eyelet sheets that had been hung on the window. I love it, she stated, with the enthusiasm of an eight-year-old, having just been presented with a new puppy. But Mrs. Jones, you haven't even seen the room yet. Just wait. That doesn't have anything to do with it, she said. Happiness is something you decide on ahead of time. Whether I like my room or not, doesn't depend on how the furniture is arranged. It's how I arrange my mind. When you change the way you look at things, even if you're legally blind, the things you look at change. God bless you, and thank you. For